Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Medical Report, where we bring health to your ears. We are your hosts, Olu, and I am Anita. And we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Qualls, with uh, Quality Health Physical Therapy and Wellness. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Yeah, so today we're excited to talk to you all about strengthening your pelvic muscles and improving your sexual wellness. And before we get started, Olu, how you been this week? I've been okay. Week went, week went by pretty fast, I would say. Okay. You? Nothing fun? Nothing fun. I don't do anything. I don't go anywhere. Okay. I sit in front um, of my computer and I wait for this. Every, okay. Every, every you, just, you just sit there. Cool. Um, I am in Florida now. Okay. So I started doing some clinicals uh, for my last rotation for psychiatric nurse practitioner certification. So I'm in Florida for the next few weeks. So it's been a little crazy, but I'm excited to be finished. <laughs> uh, otherwise, today we're talking about the pelvic floor and strengthening those muscles. We can get the uh, slideshow up here, background man. There we go. Pelvic floor is a collection of muscles that make up the lower aspect of the pelvis. Present in both male and female, these muscles do not, pro not only provide structural support, but they're responsible for bowel, bladder, and sexual function. As we get older or as our bodies endure different changes, such as pregnancy, we can experience a gradual weakening of these muscles that cause various symptoms. I've commonly seen this in my patients um, that have experienced issues with pelvic organ prolapse, which is basically when there's abnormal herniation or descent of those pelvic organs from their normal anatomy, like normal placement or position in their pelvis. Um, and also I've seen it with patients that have incontinence or a loss of ability to control their bladder or bowel. Uh, this can, any of this pelvic and organ prolapse can involve the uterus, it can involve the vagina for women or the bladder in men and women. I've not really seen it in men, though. Um, when this occurs, there might be a slight abnormality noted. If it's minimal amount of uh, displacement, then surgical intervention is usually not necessary unless the patient is experiencing some severe symptoms or is having no improvement after trying non-invasive options. Great first step for non-invasive options are things like pelvic floor therapy, which brings us to our guest today. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, in your experience, what conditions have you typically been treating um, with pelvic floor issues? You can put the um, slideshow off, please. Thank you. Um, well, first thing, I wanted to just do a minor correction. My company is Quality Touch Physical Therapy and Wellness, by the way. So, um, to answer your question, basically, um, there's so many different conditions, first of all. Um, I would just go over some general ones first and then we can get into some more specifics. Um, but basically what I see a lot of are conditions dealing with urinary leakage, um, urinary retention, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, um, sexual dysfunction, of course. So um, if they've ruled out any medical cause, um, erectile dysfunction, I can treat patients who are experiencing erectile dysfunction. Um, Post-surgical, so after hysterectomy, after any kind of flap surgery, after a male has had a prostate removal, um, different things like that. Uh, pregnancy, postpartum, the list goes on and on. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a few, not more than a few, conditions yeah. that are definitely addressed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that the pelvic floor really supports mm -hmm. um, anatomy-wise. And so, yeah. So um, what's your typical age demographic that you see? Oh, and oh. also, also mm -hmm. second question, um, you're a mobile service, right? Yes. Um, so again, I provide mobile services, so I go to people's homes or if they have a private space, private office, and I also offer telehealth services as well. Um, and the group, the demographic I treat, um, pretty much all adults right now, so anyone 18 and over, I would treat. I've had 18-year-olds, I've had 70-year-olds, so it's anyone in that age range, but I am going to be venturing out into doing some pediatric pelvic floor in the future. Um, that's hopefully in the upcoming year. 
what's um in terms of condition what's common for the older population versus the younger population oh um older adults i think anita kind of hit it on the head uh, prolapse for females um uh, prolapse um urinary leakage especially um pelvic pain um for instance postmenopausal women if they are still sexually active they may begin to experience a lot of dryness and things like that. So pelvic floor pain conditions, um, if they've had cancer, radiation, things like that, then they may have restricted, um, their vaginal canal may be restricted, so they may need some therapy for that. For the male patient, I will see people who have um, had a prostate removal and, and they'll be experiencing maybe urinary leakage, some ED, erectile dysfunction, and pelvic pain, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what mo what type of interventions do you use for some of those things you mentioned, like the vagismus, is that what the, that's the technical term for whenever we're having some difficulty with penetration, mm -hmm. or if the vaginal dryness, what do we kind of, what, what are things that you've used um, for those things? Oh yeah, that's a good yeah. question. Um, when I'm treating someone for a uh, sexual dysfunction, pain, pelvic pain, with sex, I may um, do some hands-on things. Um, so that may be some stretching of the musculature from the internal vaginal canal, internal rectal canal, also externally as well. We don't all, the misconception is that pelvic therapists are always doing work inside the body, but we do a lot of things at the abdomen, around the hips, um, the back as well. Um, so I'll do a lot of hands-on stuff if they are really restricted, if they're really tight. And I'll also empower them to do things too. So I'll teach them how to use devices such as the pelvic wand or vaginal dilator set. And that's just essentially these um, structures that look like little tubes and they go from small to large to kind of mimic penetration basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they use that to stretch the canal. So I'll teach them um, how to use those. Also, of course, a lot of exercise-based things. So once we begin to work on the things manually, we want to follow up and make sure that they are doing things on their own. So flexibility is important a lot of times for some pelvic pain conditions. Um, so we'll do hip uh, flexibility, uh, trunk flexibility. Um, also strengthening, quite honestly, strengthening yeah. of the core and the hips. So those are some typical things that I would employ into a treatment plan. What are good things for that for the prostatectomy with people that are experiencing the ED? Mm -hmm. and, um, you um, know, the yeah. funny the funny thing is a lot of it is similar as far as the the method. It's just going to be maybe different cueing for a male versus a female. Um, but for instance, if someone had a total prostatectomy, I'm going to see them usually shortly after their six week mark when they've gone to see their surgeon um, post post surgical. Um, and we're gonna work on pretty much the same thing. If I did the assessment and I found that something was tight, I'm gonna release it, I'm gonna stretch it. If something is weak, which it usually would be a little bit, I'm gonna tighten it. Um, especially if they're having leakage, a lot of times they have that um, difficulty controlling their urine. So we're gonna start doing some pelvic floor strengthening exercises, which commonly are known as Kegels, but we're trying to come away from that term. It's just the old white man, but that's okay. okay um, yeah. <laughs> We know about those kegels. <laughs> yeah. So we um, so we will do some um, pelvic floor contractions to strengthen the pelvic floor. But I always like to tell people, because sometimes they tell me, oh, I just started doing kegels because I Googled it. Um, you want to always have had some kind of assessment to see what your muscles are like. Because um, sometimes you could be doing that to your detriment. So, and that's for any gender, because I get that a lot. I just started doing kegels because my friend told me or because I heard it on the podcast or whatever. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, did I hear correctly that you do manual therapy? Mm -hmm. um, yes. All right. What exact? How hands-on are you getting, and what exactly are you doing? So when I do a assessment, I'm going to speak from the standpoint of a female or someone who identifies as female. So if I'm doing a, a assessment on a woman, I'm going to once I get to the pelvic floor portion because I do a whole orthopedic assessment of their spine and their hips, right? looking at range of motion and all of that stuff. So I've gotten to the pelvic floor part. I'm gonna, um, with gloves on of course, I'm gonna assess the external genitalia. So I'm going to look for any atypical skin conditions. I'm gonna also look for dryness, you know, just anything that seems out of the norm. 
So I'm going to also then begin to touch or palpate the external area around the opening. I'm going to touch where the perineum is, that space between the um, vaginal opening and the rectal opening. Um, and then I'm going to have them try to contract their muscles, relax, and maybe gently push out to see how they how well they control them. Um, then we're going to switch to the internal vaginal assessment usually. And so with gloves on, lubricant, I'm going to touch the muscles from the inside and I'm going to feel the muscle um, quality, see if anything feels atypical, tight, loose all of that stuff and then have them show me what they can do with their muscles again i'm going to say can you squeeze for me can you relax and can you bear down so if i found that they were tight i'm going to do stretches with my usually my first finger my digit my first digit i'm going to stretch the muscles i'm going to apply gentle pressure and trigger point release somewhat similar to what you would do for any other muscle in the body but obviously a lot more gentle we're not heavy handed in this situation because you want to not, you know, make them uncomfortable. Um, I'm going to, yeah. yeah, yes, yes. And I'm also going to, I usually, it's not just so um, one note, I will sometimes have them do different positioning of their leg if I need to get to a certain structure or if I'm trying to um, get a certain outcome. So we'll do a lot of mobility based things in conjunction with the hands on part. That's awesome. Uh -huh. And so how does, people, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. For some people, they may also um, require a rectal assessment where I do the same thing rectally as well, depending on what's going on with them as well. Yeah, that's usually how the prostate exam is done mm -hmm. too. Yeah, rectally. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, exam, what exercises do you recommend to improve overall pelvic floor health? Outside I love of Kegels. This. Yes, I love this question because <laughs> I um, will often get like people asking, well, what can I do? What can I do? Yeah. And I always, honestly, I defer people to, well, I always deflect from saying, you can do these five exercises because it's really not going to be that cut and dry. It's not good to um, Yeah, it's really too tough to kind of sum up into five or six things. But I will say, generally speaking, to have a healthy pelvic floor, you usually want to have a strong core and strong hips. And then you also want to have muscles that are lengthened as well. Everybody will do strengthening, you know, exercises, but they kind of uh, skip out on their stretching. And so your hip muscles need to be elongated. Your core, meaning your front, not just the front, not just the six pack muscles. We mean all of the muscles around the whole trunk. They need to be lengthened as well, because if you're trying to go in and do strengthening of any muscle and it's short, you're not going to get the most efficient um, effect that you're trying to get. Hmm. It's interesting. Uh -huh. Um, have you heard of the yoni egg? <laughs> yes, I have heard of it. I have not really had any real experience with it. Um, so from what I understand, it's a egg-shaped object, and it's usually inserted into the vaginal canal. Now, the purpose—I don't know who you know everyone's purpose for using it, but I'm assuming they use it for a little like to squeeze on. Um. And so I don't really have an opinion one way or the other. It's really, you know, personal preference. Personal preference. I will say if someone is utilizing um, any device that they insert in their vaginal canal, then they need to have had an assessment first because okay. a lot of times if your muscles are already tight and you're inserting something in that's weighted, you're just going to have your muscles working harder. And so that can lead to pelvic, more tightness which can lead to pelvic pain. So that's one thing I always tell caution people on. Also, um, there are specific devices people can use for that, like weighted objects that yeah. aren't um, porous. Right. From my understanding, some of the Yoni products may be made mm -hmm. of material that has pores. Yeah. And you want to really be careful with porous structures because bacteria can get into it. And if you're inserting it into your, back, your vaginal canal, that obviously can lead to infection. So I always tell people, look for something that's non-porous if you're going to insert it in obviously have had an assessment by a pelvic floor professional to see the quality of your muscles first and see if that's even necessary because some people don't even have the strength to do just a squeeze without the egg in. So they are just working their muscles really hard for no reason. Like I always tell people, if you if you haven't been working out, you wouldn't go lift 500 pounds. You're gonna start off right. with what's appropriate to your, um, your strength level. Yeah. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Usually kind of start with body weight and yes. then, you know, simple yes. exercises Absolutely. and then work your way up to that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. What are some areas or issues that men typically run into um, other than anything that you can think of other than like the prostate or urinary issue? Um, the biggest thing I would say, not biggest, but one of the things that differs from, from women is erectile dysfunction. I think I mentioned that earlier. So yeah. they have had some issues with um, uh, attaining or maintaining erection. They would have gone to see their neurologist usually. And so if they ruled out any vascular, because I, if I have a male patient that calls the schedule, I will want them to see their urologist or, or um, primary care at least first to rule out any kind of vascular problems. Once they've done that, then they determine it may be muscular, then that's what we would go ahead and address from the physical therapy standpoint, any of the muscles of their pelvis or abdomen and so forth and so, so on. Um, in addition to that, quite honestly, men, um, they do deal with the same conditions of, um, as women a lot of times. So they can also be dealing with urinary retention where they can't get their urine out, especially if their prostate is starting to get a little bit enlarged. Mm -hmm. um, bowel stuff, so constipation, you know, sometimes difficulty holding it in if they've had some kind of GI condition or if they're older and their muscles aren't holding as well as they used to. Um, let me think. Oh, my, for my bike riders, my um, males who ride bikes often, they will have a lot of perineum pain sometimes to, you know, total pain and things like that and tightness too. So I'll treat them for things like that as well. I'm even think seat. about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, you gotta so change your seat. Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes that's what we talk about, you know, getting a seat that's more appropriate, obviously. Definitely stretching, stretching, stretching after the ride. Um, making sure that their posture on the bike is not you know, pr providing too much compression as best as possible. When you're doing these long century rides, then, you know, it's, it's kind of tough to do everything, you know, in that yeah. at the time. So um, I have a question going back a little bit. Uh -huh. So I know that you have a pelvic floor certification. Um, my first question is, how was that? Um, uh -huh. And then my second question is, you know, why did you dive into this field at all? Because this is pretty uncommon. Yeah, PTs, and you're the only person that I know that does this. <laughs> yes. Um, so the certification, the process was pretty um, intense as far as the studying and, and testing. I think the test was like, honestly, I can't even remember. I feel like I was in there for three hours. But um, basically, you know, just having to prepare over the course of time, um, reading through a lot of material. If you took so the the organization that I got certified through is called Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehab Institute. And so if I've taken any of those classes, I went through all of the binders that we would get from different courses, then also articles, um, you know, journals, things like that, but also just, um, you know, general anatomy, physiology, um, and so forth and so on. Um, and then we had to take a certification exam at the end. And I think it was like three or four hours, if I'm not mistaken. And so that was the most grueling part, sitting for that long. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's usually going to be um, active for about 10 years. We have to retest every 10 years. Um, and then from there, that's pretty much it. Just making sure you keep up to date with everything, making sure that you are um, also just doing your general continuing education that's focused on pelvic floor conditions and staying up to, up to speed with things not getting, you know, too laxed. And so that's typically how that certification process goes. Um, that basically gives us the ability to treat any condition um, for all genders dealing with the bowel, bladder, and sexual systems of our bodies. Um, and to answer your second question, you said, why did I delve into it? Um, you know, so when I was in PT school, these two women came and did like a um, two day, I think it was about two days of a lecture series and um, had some lab involved and they told us all about pelvic floor and I hadn't even heard of it up until that point. And so it was just really interesting to me because I've always been, at that time it was considered women's health. They didn't really even address the men at that point. So I was always interested in um, women's health related, um, you know, services. So that really just drew me in from that standpoint. Um, and I just kind of, I did my um, capstone project 
on a pelvic floor related condition. So I got more interested in it. And from there, I just kind of started taking coursework and obviously working in different settings that offer pelvic floor. And it just kind of skyrocketed it from there. Nice. I think that's awesome. Super mm -hmm. unique. Yeah. Oh, guys, by the way, we can go ahead and start our Q&A segment. So if you guys have any questions, drop them in the chat and we'll answer them as we keep checking. This is nice. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So men, um, when men are uh, experiencing retention from BPH, maybe, which is like the nine prostatic hyper, which you guys basically just means your prostate is enlarged for those mm -hmm. that are listening. Um, I know from a primary care standpoint, um, patients can be put on medication to help reduce the size of that prostate, mm -hmm. to help with that because they'll have that retention of urine because of it. So when in your experience, when you're dealing with um, those types of things, when they're in large prostate, what type of exercises, or is it like an elongation of the muscle that you're focusing on, or is mm -hmm. it, well, how does that work? Yeah, that's good. Um, good question. Um, so a lot of times when they have um, enlarged prostate, I'll find that there's been a lot of straining and pushing, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times your muscles are tighter from that process. So I would do hands-on work with them to release any tight muscles around that genital area. And then also complement it with stretches that they would do on their own at home. Or if some of them are open to using any kind of tool to release themselves, then they will use that to stretch the tight structures. We also not just only work at the genitals, we also do a lot of abdominal release work because the abdomen is so directly correlated with the fascia of the pelvic floor. We want to stretch that tissue out um, at that lower pelvic um, diaphragm area. And then also a lot of breath work. So teaching them about breathing properly, not straining on the toilet, um, positioning on the toilet. So a lot of education on toilet and positioning mechanics as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we got some questions in here. Let's go ahead and take some questions. India Barn says, what interventions are common for men? I think we talked about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, India, the recap, we just spoke a little bit about this earlier. We talked about erectile dysfunction, um, post-surgical conditions. So if they've had prostate removal or any, any kind of surgery around the genital region, um, if they are having any pain at the penis, scrotum, uh, rectum. So those conditions are things that I would say were more specific to men, but they also experience some of the things that women experience as well, like urinary retention, urinary leakage, constipation, diarrhea, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. India also says, what can we do as a daily regular routine that will enhance vaginal health? So I can take this. So mm -hmm. from primary care standpoint, um, a lot of times I'll get my ladies come in, may have yeast infection, BV. These are common things that we experience without there being some type of outside factor at times. Um, as when, Outside factor I'm talking about is mainly STDs. So um, this would be something that we can naturally have occur in our bodies. So things that can help with that are um, taking probiotics. There are probiotics over the counter that we ladies can look at and buy. I know a lot of times when I talk to my patients, people don't even realize that we have that like at our in our hands like you literally just go to a, a drugstore over the counter it says vaginal health for women probiotic um it kind of helps keep that ph balance um we should avoid douching uh douching are things that throw off our ph balance even though we use it probably to make it smell a little better down there but it can do the opposite to us um regular things obviously trying trying to stay away from scented products when washing that can worsen our pH. Um, even thinking about what you eat, yeah. drinking your water, all of those things really factor into our vaginal health. Anybody else have anything to add? I think you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't have anything to add, but I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna stay out of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys are the experts. <laughs> But um, my question is, I know I asked you about IBS before we started. Um, I've had a patient in the past who was constipated um, and didn't go to the bathroom, I think, for over a week. Mm -hmm. What kind of exercises would you give to that person to get their bowels moving? 
Well, um, I wouldn't necessarily say there's any one particular exercise, really. It depends on what I find when I did their evaluation. But I will say um, more than likely, if they have constipation, there's some some tension in their in their pelvic canal. So for women, it'll be vaginal canal and rectal canal. And for men, it'll be the rectum. So if I did the assessment and I found that tightness, I'm going to want to give them a stretching of the hips and trunk. So hamstrings, hip flexors, inner and outer thighs, that whole area, the whole um, midsection and lower portion of our bodies, right? And then also we want to work on um, biomechanics, teaching them about proper um, release techniques when they're toileting, because a lot of times people are on the toilet and they're straining or they are rushing or they actually, for some people who have more advanced conditions, like you mentioned, IBS or Crohn's or colitis or any, any condition that's just um, more, more uh, like I said, advanced pathology, they mm -hmm. may also develop, um, how do I explain it? Their ability, they don't understand, their muscles don't understand what to do. I'm going to say that from a general standpoint. So they may be pulling in when it's time to let go oh. and push out. So we will do an assessment to see, are you actually letting go or are you, and if I find that they are doing the opposite of what they should do, we'll work on helping them identify how to use those muscles properly during toileting, incorporating breathing and um, getting your knees up higher than your hips. That's a huge part on the toilet for people who don't have, even people who don't have IBS. I recommend a, a squatty potty, which is a step stool essentially. So you can get like yeah. a regular step stool and put it under your feet because we want to open up the muscle that is called the puborectalis muscle. It wraps around and close off the rectum so you don't poop all the time. And when it's time to go, it elongates. But some people have tension in that muscle. So the squatty potty or similar products help to get your knees up higher than your hips so that you can expel a little oh. bit easier. You commonly see that in Asian countries. I mean, when I went to Japan and their public restrooms, they even just have the yep. hole on the floor where you kind of squat over it. Mm -hmm. But it's that that position. Absolutely. I'm trying to be more in the squatting position, mm -hmm. having a movement. Yeah. And your legs don't fall asleep. <laughs> it's true. I hope that people's legs don't fall asleep. That means you're sitting on the toilet too long, which I'm going to say. That means stop, stop scrolling on your phone while you're yes. pooping, Olu. <laughs> That's really what it is. Leave me alone. That's my quality time, okay? This is you. <laughs> you okay. Be on the toilet more than five minutes from a pelvic floor standpoint. You shouldn't be on the toilet more than five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. That means you go in it. Oh, you do you need any more details. <laughs> okay. No more details from you, Olive. <laughs> He's like, five minutes is not I, long I need a little bit longer than five minutes. Yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, India says, can you give an example of when you had to refer someone back to their doctor? Oh yeah, that happens. I actually, so let me say this. I love collaborating with my uh, medical practitioners. It works best when we are working together. So I would say, quite honestly, I'm often working with them. Like the, the, the patient may have seen me first or may have seen them first, and we are communicating regularly. So sometimes if a person came to me because we're in the direct access area where you don't need a referral, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you come to me and you haven't seen the physician or nurse practitioner or any other medical person first, then we would have started working on whatever I found in your evaluation. And let's say we're not progressing as well as I would like to, if, if it seems like there's some kind of disconnect or if, if I think that something may be going on other than just a musculoskeletal issue, I'll refer back for that reason. Like if I have a person, when I do the... Um, evaluation, I look at their skin. If their skin um, of the vulva, for instance, looks um, scarred down, they could have a condition. Um, geez, and it's slipping my mind. This is what happened when you get in the fourth decade. Um, <laughs> lichen, scler <laughs> lichen sclerosis. And it's basically a scarring condition of the vulva tissue. I want to make sure that they're working with a physician because I'm not going to change the pathology. I want to make sure that someone's looking at their tissue because uncontrolled lichens can, can lead to down the line some type of vulvar cancer. So we want to make sure that we're looking for those pathologies that are outside of our scope. Um, also, if they if they have a really severe pain condition, 
that is really difficult to manage conservatively, I may have them refer to their um, physician for pain management. So that could be medicational procedures, injections, things like that. Um, what else? If something ever occurs that's just out of the norm, like if, if we're working together and they're telling me, oh, yeah, I started bleeding all of a sudden, for, and it's not their menstrual cycle, for instance, or yeah, anything like that, I'm going to say, you know what, you should probably see your G if, if, it's re if it's bleeding with bowels, you should go to a GI, you should see your gynecologist. I always look for anything that seems atypical from a physical therapy standpoint. Right. Yeah. And when do you decide to refer someone to their gynecologist? When, oh, okay. Same, kind of the same um, answer I just gave. Yeah. Um, let's say, for instance, I'm working with someone and they, oh, they have um, vaginal dryness. I may say, you know, I'm going to say you should try lubricant. If that doesn't work, then you need to probably speak to your gynecologist or other type of um, vulvo vaginal specialist to maybe get something that's medicated because sometimes that's related to hormonal imbalances, even in younger women. It's not just older women who experience vulva dryness. So you may want to get, um, uh, they sometimes will do a um, labs for a hormonal panel and see if something's off or they may just go based off of what they've uh, observed, observed during the assessment and give you some kind of type of topical hormonal cream or gel, usually estrogen based to yep. basically be estrogen acid tissues. Yeah, usually in younger women, if you're having some type of vaginal dryness, sometimes it can be related to medications you may be taking, mm -hmm. very commonly related to that most of the time. Most of the time, younger women are having the issue, but um, of course, in our older women, we're going to find it more frequently, especially after menopause. Mm -hmm. um, our hormones change, mm -hmm. and so that with that comes all the hot flashes and everything else, and then we also get vaginal dryness. How fun. Yeah. And like she's just mentioned, usually uh, the estrogen cream is recommended if you are not at high risk for other things like cancer or things like that, then you know you should be good to go with the estrogen cream. Um, what are other things I was trying to think of? There was something else I wanted to talk about. Um, I, had, I had a question. Um, have you met any men in your field? And that's, I always have a two part question. Have you met any men in your field and do mm -hmm. Do the men that you see as patients maybe sometimes feel reluctant to give information or, um, yes, or have a female therapist basically? Mm -hmm. I would say that's a good question. Um, yes, I have met a few, but it's not um, not very many, quite honestly. When I go to courses, it's majority women led and women, you know, participants. Um, so a few guys are getting into the field. But um, as far as my patients are concerned, um, I would say by the time someone has seen me, they are at their wit's end. So I tend to find that they are a little bit more forthcoming with information, but there are some that I have to like pry it out of gradually. Um, and also I'm just gonna make sure they're comfortable. I'm not gonna do anything or force anybody to tell me anything, but there are some details I do need to know. Um, you know, especially when it comes to us talking about the sexual stuff, like I've had to ask about positions or, are you aggressive or whatever the case may be, because that can give me an idea of what may have occurred from a muscular standpoint. Um, you know, I've had patients who, um, you know, participate in certain things. And so I need to know what exactly took place so I can give you the best, um, you know, out, you know, treatment plan, basically. Good. That's awesome. What exercises or interventions for men do you prescribe? Um, similar to the to the ones for women. So um, I don't typically find that there's a different um, exercise prescription, so to speak, for gen based on gender. But um, usually it's going to, your physical it's therapy is going to involve some level of stretching, some level of strengthening. Um, and that could be for the trunk, for the hips, and obviously for the pelvic floor itself. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a, a well-rounded program that you're going to do that involves that whole system of the body. And you have a physical location, right? I'm actually mobile. I'm exclusively mobile. So I travel mm -hmm. around. Oh. Yep, I travel to different. And what state areas. are you in? I'm actually licensed in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Okay. okay. I was actually going to ask you if you use things like diathermy or ECM or but that was if you had <laughs> oh, yeah. a physical location. 
<laughs> no, I mean, um, I do bring some things with me because um, I, you know, I have a lot of different tools that I use with some of my patients. But typically speaking, even when I'm at a physical location, there's not a lot of um, machinery I, I typically use. It, it doesn't always lend to the to time management piece for me, but also um, it may not even be necessary. But for some people, I do have a portable ESIM unit, a portable biofeedback unit. Um, not the ones that you would see, like for your quads, obviously, it's going to be a little different. So um, I have those with me that I bring for people who may need that kind of thing. So virtually, are you seeing patients outside of DMV or is it just those areas because you're licensed there? Yeah, just the ones I'm licensed in. Um, okay. So for physical therapy services, I'm um, only able to do virtual in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia region. Okay. Uh -huh. Good. Yes. I've learned so much today. I'm oh, glad. I'm glad. I I, yeah. I know that I need to hurry up when I go to the bathroom, apparently. Yes. <laughs> well, don't hurry up. Don't rush, but you shouldn't be sitting there until your legs fall asleep. That means that you are putting a little bit too much pressure around that um, the anal area, and that could lead to things down the line. So you don't want to do that too often. Yeah. The opposite with rushing can cause hemorrhoids. So exactly. You don't need that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'll set a timer on my phone. You need like an in-between area. Yeah. Some balance. Some balance for sure. Mm -hmm. Move quick, but don't hurry. <laughs> <laughs> more, so, more so, just go when you have the urge and relax. If you're Actually, if you're on your phone, you're distracted, and it's harder for your bowels to move when you're distracted. So it's best to just go when you have the urge and, and you know, put your feet up on the step stool, sit comfortably, do a couple of deep breaths. It should come out pretty easily and then get up and go. You hear that, okay. Anita? Hurry up. I, I have used the step stool. I'm <laughs> personally, I, I prefer it. I'm just saying. But um, otherwise, thank you guys for joining us today. Dr. Qualls, we enjoyed you. Thank you for joining yeah. us. You guys can reach out to her on her social media yeah. and uh, her her quality touch PT, right? Yes. Yeah, on all social media platforms. So um, we hope you guys will tune in with us again in two weeks. Connect with us on our businesses if you want to speak with us as well and our social medias. Give our uh, video today a like and share. We want to feel the love, of course. And if you're watching after our live session has ended and you still have questions, please feel free to leave them. We'll still answer your questions. Um, if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to hear from us, please let us know. DM, DM us. We're still here throughout the week, too. Just saying. Until next time, we'll see you guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>